Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and that is Matthew Stockton. No, that was Loon's. No, loons first, yes, <laughs> but us second, yeah. Hello, everybody. How are you? You sound like you are still not well. It's a week later, and I am still ill. Oh my goodness! So you bring, you keep bringing the lurgy to my house. I think we're playing Russian roulette at this point. The show must go on. Well, I don't. Well, if I get sick, I don't know if that's going to be the thing. <laughs> I'll push the buttons. You, you'll push the buttons. Yeah, there's more to it. <laughs> Than just pushing buttons. <laughs> exactly. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, Family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. On November 4, 1979, Iranian militants attacked the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, Iran, taking 66 diplomats and staff members hostage. Remarkably, six diplomats managed to slip away unnoticed. These individuals were Robert Anders, Cora Lijek, Mark Lijek, Joseph Stafford, Kathleen Stafford, and Lee Schatz. Schatz sought refuge at the Swedish Embassy while the others went to the British Embassy. However, upon nearing the embassy, they encountered a large group of protesters obstructing their path. Consequently, they decided to take shelter at Anders' residence and devise their next steps. After six harrowing days, the six American diplomats sought refuge at the Canadian embassy. The Canadian ambassador to Iran, Ken Taylor, and his team provided the American diplomats shelter and false Canadian passports. The Canadian government played a critical role in the mission to rescue them. The then-Canadian Prime Minister, Joe Clark, approved the operation and fully supported Ambassador Taylor and his team. The rescue mission, known as the Canadian Caper, involved the creation of a fake movie production company called Studio 6 and the production of a fake science fiction film called Argo. The Canadian Embassy staff, along with the American diplomats, managed to escape from Iran using a combination of air travel and ground transportation. They were safely evacuated from Iran on January 29, 1980. The role played by Canada in the hostage crisis was highly appreciated by the U.S. government and earned Canada international recognition for helping resolve the crisis. This is Dark Poutine, Episode 267, The Canadian Caper, Canada's Role in the Iran Hostage Crisis. The Iran hostage crisis is the first extended news story that I can recall being interested in. I was just nine years old at the time, and it significantly impacted me. My family used to watch ABC News Tonight with news anchor Frank Reynolds with reports from Barbara Walters and Sam Donaldson, 
I remember dad being particularly upset by the events as American hostages were paraded blindfolded and taken to various locations where they were held captive for 444 days. We had no idea at the time that behind the scenes, Ken Taylor and the Canadian government were hiding six other Americans and working on a creative plan to help smuggle them out of Iran. Before getting into the escape, let's set the stage with some of Iran's complex history leading up to the hostage crisis. Prior to the Iranian Revolution in 1979, Iran was ruled by Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who had been installed as the Shah of Iran by a CIA-backed coup in 1953. Under the Shah's rule, Iran experienced rapid modernization, urbanization, and economic growth, which led to significant changes in Iranian society and culture. During this time, Iran became increasingly westernized, with many Iranians adopting Western-style clothing, music, and entertainment. The country also experienced a period of economic prosperity with the development of industries such as oil, petrochemicals, and automobiles, which led to the growth of the Iranian middle class. Let's talk about oil for a minute. Okay, let's. <laughs> because surprise, surprise. Yeah. That will, that's what was really behind um, this U.S.-led and U.K.-participated mm -hmm. uh, coup. Ah, uh, yeah. It, this was actually the first coup that the CIA instigated against a democratically elected government. Oh, wow. It was called Operation Ajax. Mm -hmm. um, it was joint venture between the UK and the USA. The Iranian prime minister, Mossadegh at the time, yep. was making moves to nationalize the oil industry. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, which at the time was almost completely run by British Petroleum, which, to give them their dues, are the ones that went with the technology and found the oil in the first place. Sure, sure. Right? Yeah. But this was a massive threat to the BP company, mm -hmm. to profits, to shareholders. And not only that, the, the British um, Royal Navy was highly dependent on the oil from Iran. Okay. And so losing it would have actually been been a threat to the global dominance of their British Navy. Wow. Right. So a lot of implications. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is always a reason why a, a dictator is installed. And it's almost always oil. Have you, you found you, that? It's well, almost always oil. It is it, <laughs> lately. Yep. There's a resource. Well, that, lately from the last few hundred years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for the Americans, you know, Iran, when you feel like a map, Iran's right next to the Soviet Union, right? Mm -hmm. And there was concern about the spread of communism and the influence of of, of Soviet Russia um, on the Middle East and on that oil. We're seeing all that again today, aren't yeah, we? Yeah. yeah. So to this day, for detractors of the West in, in Iran, America is called the Great Satan. And the UK, I kind of find it kind of cute, is called the Little Satan. The Little Satan. <laughs> Oi, I don't want to be the Little Satan. <laughs> I'm Michael Caine. However, despite all its apparent benefits, the Shah's regime was also characterized by political repression, censorship, widespread corruption, and inequality. Particularly brutal was the Shah's Savak, Iran's secret police and intelligence agency during the rule of the Shah from 1957 to 1979. Savak was established with the assistance of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and Israel's Mossad to maintain the Shah's grip on power and suppress political dissent. During the Shah's rule, Savak was involved in various activities to preserve the regime's authority and stability. Some of their activities included 1. Surveillance. Savak conducted extensive domestic and foreign surveillance to gather intelligence on potential threats to the regime. This included monitoring the activities of Iranian citizens, opposition groups, and foreign diplomats. 2. Censorship Savak played a key role in suppressing free speech and controlling the flow of information within Iran. They monitored and censored media outlets including newspapers, radio, and television, to ensure that only pro-regime messages were disseminated. 3. Suppression of dissent. Savak targeted political dissidents, opposition groups, and critics of the Shah's regime. They arrested and detained and interrogated individuals deemed a threat to the regime, often using brutal methods and torture. 4. Infiltration. Savak agents infiltrated various political, religious, and social groups in Iran to gather information and disrupt opposition activities. 
This included infiltrating universities, labor unions, and religious institutions. 5. Assassinations and kidnappings. In some cases, Savak targeted assassinations and kidnappings of key opposition figures within Iran and abroad. Savak's activities were criticized for their human rights abuses and lack of transparency. The organization became a symbol of the Shah's oppressive regime. Its brutal tactics contributed to the growing discontent among the Iranian population, and after the revolution, Savak was disbanded and replaced by the Islamic Republic of Iran's intelligence agencies. The Shah's close alliance with the United States, which provided military and economic support to his regime, was deeply unpopular among many Iranians who resented foreign influence in their country. In addition, some of the Shah's policies, such as land reforms, secularization, and modernization, eroded traditional Iranian culture and values. In the late 1970s, opposition to the Shah's regime grew increasingly vocal and militant. The opposition movement was led by Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini, a religious leader whom the Shah had exiled in the 1960s. Although there was already much unrest in the country, the mass protests in January 1978 were often seen as the symbolic beginning of the Iranian Revolution. The protests in the Qom were significant because they represented a convergence of opposition forces from different segments of Iranian society, including leftists, nationalists, religious leaders, and students. They also signaled the beginning of a broader popular movement that would eventually topple the Shah's regime and establish the Islamic Republic under the leadership of Ayatollah Khomeini. Moreover, the protests in the Qom were followed by similar demonstrations in other cities across Iran, which helped to galvanize widespread opposition to the Shah's rule and set the stage for the revolution proper. For the next year, things escalated. And as the protests continued, the demands of the opposition movement grew more radical, with many calling for overthrowing the Shah's regime and establishing a new political and social system based on Islamic principles. Finally, in December 1978, millions of Iranians protested all over the country, demanding the removal of the Shah and return of Ayatollah Khomeini. Exiled in Paris, Khomeini formed the Revolutionary Council to coordinate his transition to power. Iran became a dangerous place for the Shah, whose grip on power was lost. He had also become ill, suffering from an aggressive form of lymphatic cancer. Under the pretense of a vacation on January 16, 1979, the Shah and his family departed Iran for Egypt so he could undergo medical treatment. Before leaving, the Shah entrusted Iran to the care of Prime Minister Bakhtiar, saying, quote, I leave Iran in your hands and in God's. He never returned. The Shah's departure paved the way for the triumphant return of Ayatollah Khomeini, who came back on February 1, 1979, and was celebrated by what is estimated to be millions who flooded the streets of Tehran. Three days later, Khomeini appointed Mehdi Bazargan as the prime minister of an interim government. Bakhtiar insisted that he remained the head of the only legitimate Iranian government and announced a countrywide curfew and martial law. Khomeini ordered his followers to ignore the curfew and rise up in a national revolution. Under pressure from the masses, the armed forces declared neutrality and the remnants of the Shah's government collapsed. Bakhtiar quickly fled Iran for France. He was assassinated there in 1991 by Iranian agents. On February 14, 1979, the U.S. Embassy in Tehran was first attacked by crowds, resulting in embassy staff initially surrendering. However, the protesters were later ousted by order of Iran's acting foreign minister, Ibrahim Yazdi. On March 8, tens of thousands of Iranian women protested in Tehran on International Women's Day opposing mandatory veiling. This significant event reflected the growing opposition to the government's imposition of strict Islamic laws and its impact on women's rights. From March 30th to the 31st, Iranians participated in a national referendum that proposed whether Iran should become an Islamic republic, which received near-unanimous support despite offering no alternative options. On May 5th, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps was established by a decree issued by Ayatollah Khomeini, further solidifying the regime's power and control. On August 3rd, Iranians voted in nationwide elections for the Assembly of Experts, a clerical-dominated body empowered to finalize the draft constitution. 
However, the election was marred by boycotts by leftist, nationalist, and some Islamist factions, resulting in low voter turnout. On October 14th, the Assembly of Experts approved a draft new constitution that enshrined Khomeini's innovative doctrine of Valayat e Fake. Bless you. Yeah, exactly. Which translates roughly into guardianship of the Islamic jurist. So essentially, it makes the leader of the country, who is a religious leader, the final say in everything that happens there. So So, so it was the creation of a theocracy. Yes. And it accords ultimate authority to that religious leader, cementing the Islamic Republic's political and social order, which is still in power today. Living in a theocracy would be hell. I think so, too. Yeah, oddly, many people in the West actually think we should be living in a, in a Christian theocracy, which would be just as horrible as any other religious theocracy. I agree. Right. I mean, we're, we're seeing what's happening in the U.S. right now with different states have different values. Yeah. And we're seeing some really yucky things start to happen. I mean, I don't know how I, you know, I haven't really thought about this too much, but just the other day, Florida approved the death penalty for people who are pedophiles who brutally assault children. Mm-hmm. So it's not even for murder anymore. Now okay. the, the death penalty will be for someone who sexually assaults a child. And a lot of people on the face of that will say, okay, good. But, uh, you know, break it down. Think about it. And it's just a pretty slow, before you know it, mm-hmm. mark my words, somebody will be found helping a woman get an abortion, yep. be charged with murder, and be get the death penalty. Yeah. Um, technically, on paper, Mike, we live in a theocracy. Uh, we do. Well, the queen is the head of state, but also oh, the queen, the king, is the head of state, but also the head of the... Head of the uh, church. Head of the church. Yeah. But um, it's a constitutional democracy, luckily. Luckily. The guardianship of the Islamic jurist doctrine remains a central pillar of Iran's political and social system and is now enshrined in Iran's constitution. Under this doctrine, the ultimate authority in Iran is vested in a supreme leader, a religious scholar who serves as the country's highest-ranking political and religious authority. The current supreme leader of Iran is Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who succeeded Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini after he died in 1989. Iran's new Islamic government saw the Shah's presence in Egypt as a provocation. It demanded that he be extradited to Iran to stand trials for crimes that he was accused of committing during his rule. The Shah's continued presence in Egypt also strained Egypt's relations with other Arab countries, which were supportive of the new Iranian government. Under pressure from the United States, concerned about the Shah's safety and the potential for further unrest in Iran, the Shah was eventually allowed to seek refuge in the U.S. Jimmy Carter, the president of the United States at the time, allowed the Shah of Iran to enter the country for medical treatment. The Shah and his family arrived in New York in October 1979, and he lived in exile until he died in 1980. The decision to allow the Shah's entry into the U.S. was difficult because it had domestic and international political implications. While there were concerns about potentially violent protests by Iranian exiles in the U.S., refusing the Shah's entry could damage U.S.-Iran relations and harm the interests of U.S. businesses in Iran. The admission of the Shah was seen by many Iranians as evidence of U.S. support for the deposed Shah's regime contributing to the outbreak of the crisis and fueling anti-American sentiment. The decision to admit the Shah was a significant factor in the events that led to the Iranian hostage crisis. On November 4, 1979, a group of young men who were Iranian students, militants, and Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, IRGC, members, stormed the United States Embassy in Tehran. The takeover of the U.S. Embassy was well-coordinated, with the militants disabling its communication systems and taking control of the building and its occupants. The militants overpowered the embassy staff, taking 52 American diplomats and citizens hostage. The militants demanded the return of the Shah to Iran to stand trial for his crimes as well as freezing of Iranian assets held by the U.S. government. The hostage crisis was also driven by the militants' desire to undermine the fledgling Iranian government, which they saw as insufficiently committed to Islamic principles and too friendly with the United States. 
The group that took hostages did not represent the broader Iranian population, which was divided in its support for the revolution and the new Islamic government. While some Iranians supported the militants' actions and saw the embassy takeover as a symbol of resistance against American influence in Iran, others condemned the takeover as a violation of international law and an attack on diplomatic norms. Western media reports of the revolution and crisis painted a one-dimensional picture of Iran as a country filled with hate for Western values. The reality was much more complicated. Although there were many Iranians who were against what Khomeini and his supporters represented, fear for their lives kept them quiet. Dissenters and those connected to the Shah were being summarily executed in the streets by violent mobs. So that sounds fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting that, that you, you talk about the media painting this sort of one-dimensional picture of Iran. Right? Yeah. And um, did you ever see that TED Talk speech by a Nigerian author named Chimamanda Adichie? No. She is from a wealthy Nigerian family. Okay. And she coined the term, the danger of a single story. Oh, wow. That essentially points out how everyone always wants to boil down the other into some linear single story and, and losing all the complexity. Yeah, there's no nuance to it. No nuance, yeah. and, and that it leads to sort of an incomplete or incorrect understandings uh, of culture, mm -hmm. right? And leads to misunderstanding and, and stops us from recognizing sort of the, what should we call it, the, the nuance of the human experience, right? Sure, sure, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that's what I try to do with the way I write is try to give perspectives yeah. from, because I mean, we could say, give a perspective of this is a horrible thing that happened. These are horrible people. And that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. But it's like we've said many times, the story always has a lot of different aspects that definitely need looking at. And human beings are far more complex than just a single story. Absolutely. The events of the Iran hostage crisis planted seeds of deep fear and mistrust of Middle Easterners in an entire generation of North Americans and Western Europeans that still persist today, facilitated by groups with names like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, but particularly since the terrorist attacks of 9-11 in 2001. The hostage crisis lasted for 14 months and 20 days becoming a defining moment in U.S.-Iran relations and shaping the political landscape of the Middle East for decades to come. There were, however, those six Americans we mentioned at the show's outset who managed to escape the embassy. During the siege, Lee Schatz, who served as the American agricultural attaché, casually walked through the crowd and sought refuge with the Swedish embassy. In addition to Schatz, five other Americans escaped the embassy compound unnoticed. This group included Robert Anders, the head of the consular section, and two consular attachés, Mark Lijak and Joe Stafford, along with their wives, Kathleen Stafford and Cora Lijak. They cautiously made their way through the streets and eventually reached the safety of Anders' apartment. Ken Taylor, the Canadian ambassador in Iran, first learned of the U.S. Embassy takeover from his Swedish counterpart, whose building overlooked the compound. Taylor promptly informed the Canadian government in Ottawa. Four days later, John Sheardown, Taylor's chief immigration officer, received a surprising phone call from Bob Anders. Anders explained the situation and asked if he and his group could be given shelter within the next few days. Sheardown promised to consult the ambassador. But he reportedly asked, Why didn't you call sooner? Of course we can take you in. Count on us. Yeah, I think no surprise there, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, Ken and the U.S. were neighbors. Right. right. And we shared back then probably much of the same values maybe there's been a slight divergence of of recent years in mm -hmm. terms of yep. uh, national identity sure. and 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 values of, of the countries as a whole we're each other's biggest trading partners but i think more importantly mike is most americans know a canadian and most canadians know american we're actually truly neighbors like cousins my grandmother was actually american right Right, born in Detroit, mm -hmm. Detroit City. Yeah. Right? There's just a lot of connections, and I think historically we've always been friends. Yeah, and hopefully it stays that way. Ken Taylor wasted no time in agreeing to provide shelter for the Americans. Due to the danger of housing the Americans at the Canadian Chancery in downtown Tehran, it was determined that it would be better to split up the group. Sheardown would take three escapees to his house, while Taylor would house the others at the official residence. 
They were described to staff as Canadian tourists visiting Iran. Taylor immediately began drafting a cable to inform the Canadian government of the situation. Ken Taylor had previously served as the head of Canada's Trade Commissioner Service. He had organized the evacuation of 850 Canadians from Iran in January 1979 when it became apparent that the Shah's regime was collapsing. After Taylor's telegram informing the Canadian government of the situation, there was a frenzy of consultation in the Department of External Affairs. Michael Shenstone, the Bureau for African and Middle Eastern Affairs Director General, quickly agreed that Canada had a duty to shelter the fugitives. Alan Gottlieb, the Undersecretary, also concurred despite the risk to Canadians and Canadian property. The decision to shelter the Americans was made due to the danger they faced, and there was no alternative but to provide them with protection. Prime Minister Joe Clark was briefed on the situation, and he gave his immediate go-ahead for Taylor to act. Taylor was told that knowledge of the situation would be kept on a strict, quote, need-to-know basis. Helping the Americans was not the only way the Canadian embassy in Iran assisted Westerners at the time. They also extended their assistance to any foreign journalists in Tehran who might encounter issues with the volatile revolutionaries. Despite the growing danger to the lives of the dissenters and Westerners in the country, Ken Taylor continued to carry out his duties as a diplomat. He remained helpful to the United States by acting as a communication channel between Bruce Langan, the U.S. Chargé d'Affaires, and Washington, scouting potential helicopter landing spots and transmitting messages for two undercover CIA agents. The tension mounted among the hostages as the story began to leak, leading Taylor to order the shredding of embassy documents. The situation remained precarious for the Americans and their Canadian hosts who worried about Iranian authorities discovering the Americans. During the Islamic mob siege on the U.S. Embassy, the Americans had hastily destroyed and concealed as much equipment and sensitive documents as possible, focusing on personnel records. They knew the Iranians were desperate to reconstruct any available information to verify their list of hostages. The militants were even working to reassemble some of the shredded documents. It could be just a matter of time before they figured out some Americans had escaped. Only a timely exit would ensure everyone's safety. Despite these concerns, the Canadian government continued to support Taylor's efforts to protect the Americans. A creative plan was concocted to get the six American escapees safely and secretly out of Tehran and home to their families. More after a quick break. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts so far? I was just thinking about the beginning of the episode, and it really shows about how history isn't linear, you know? I mean, this is a fascinating story about how, how Canada helped the Americans escape. Mm -hmm. But just all that background of, like, the decades that sort of led up to this sort of, sort of situation. You know? Right. And it really sort of goes to show that you can't reduce history to this simple narrative of good versus evil or heroes versus villains. Right? No. <laughs> like, as and that's, much, what, that's why I went into it as, as deeply as, as we I did. want to, right? Yeah, because yeah. it's a nice, clean story. You know what I mean? Yeah. But there's so many factors, like, you know, social, economic, cultural, religious... Mm -hmm. But I think what's fascinating about this story is it gets this massive world event, right? Mm -hmm. But in the end, what, what's it about? It's about humans. Yeah. Right? And and this is about trying to save the lives of a few people. 
Do you remember this? Do you remember the the hostage crisis at all? No, I would have oh, been wow. 79. Yep, you oh, would have been nine. I would have been nine. Yeah. Don't think I remember it really. See, I remember it very distinctly because okay. because of, I think it was my father's reaction to it was very strong. Like he was fearful, hmm. you know, of what he was seeing on TV and, and disgusted by it, hmm. you know. I think we were watching The Price is Right. We were probably watching that too, <laughs> and Another World in the Edge of Night. No, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, it was definitely uh, a newsworthy event in our home. Ken Taylor and his group came up with four possible escape strategies. The first involved smuggling the six individuals out of the country either by crossing a land border with Turkey situated 400 miles to the west and bribing the border guards, similar to another group's successful escape, or by traversing the Shat el Arab River to reach Iraq approximately 300 miles to the south. The second option entailed disguising and escorting them through Tehran's Merbad airport to board a commercial flight out of the country. The third plan involved relocating them from Tehran to a safer point where a U.S. military helicopter would pick them up. And lastly, some believe the safest approach would be to wait for the Iranian hostage takers to let the others go. But who knows when that would happen? By the end of November 1979, only two of the four escape options were still being considered. The Canadians felt that waiting it out was not viable, as the hostages in the American embassy could potentially leave immediately, posing a problem for undisclosed house guests. Ken Taylor believed that they should start planning their exit strategy as they might need to act quickly. In December, the U.S. defense planners rejected the helicopter rescue mission as too risky leaving overland smuggling or exfiltration through the Maribad airport. Stansfield Turner, a United States Navy admiral and an intelligence expert who served as the director of central intelligence from 1977 to 1981, discussed the remaining options with President Carter, suggesting that each house guest choose their own exit strategy based on their physical stamina or ability to deceive airport inspectors. However, Carter disagreed stating that the mental and emotional state of the individuals varied and that placing the decision on them would be an enormous burden. Instead, he felt that the U.S. and Canadians should decide on the best escape plan and instruct the house guests accordingly. Turner agreed and believed that bringing them out together through the airport was the best chance. Carter approved the plan. In an extraordinary move to save the lives of the six Americans, with the approval of Conservative Prime Minister Joe Clark, a secret ordering council was passed and Canadian passports were created to be issued in the ruse to help in the escape. In the documentary Our Man in Tehran, based on Robert Wright's book of the same name, Flora MacDonald, then Canadian Secretary of State for External Affairs, admitted that her hands shook as she signed the six passports with fake identities for the Americans. The six passports were sent to the CIA in Langley who stamped them with fake Iranian visas. But when the documents arrived in Tehran, Ken Taylor's team noticed that the dates were created using the Western calendar rather than the one used by the Iranians. They would not have stood up to scrutiny at the airport and had to be destroyed. Six new passports were created and stamped with corrected visas and sent again to Tehran. The CIA's involvement in the escape plan included creating a complex cover story. Heading up the planning for the CIA was Tony Mendez a technical operations officer specializing in covert operations, particularly in disguises, false identities, and the creation of cover stories. Tony Mendez and his team needed to create a convincing cover story, allowing the six American diplomats to pose as a Canadian film crew scouting locations in Iran. To accomplish this, Mendez set up a fake production company in Hollywood called Studio Six Productions. The name was inspired by the six American diplomats they were trying to rescue. The team developed a script for a fictitious science fiction movie called Argo, based on an existing screenplay, Lord of Light, adapted from a novel by Roger Zelazny. They created storyboards, posters, and advertisements for the movie, making the project appear to be in active development. The team even took out ads and trade publications like Variety and hosted a press event to promote the fake film. That's kind of cool, actually. 
It is being in marketing. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, I want to, I want to know who they hired to like make the advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I was just thinking, oh, it'd be so cool. Imagine if like the CIA or MI five or CSIS came to me and it's like, we have a secret job for you to do. Yeah. Make fake advertising for a movie. Right. Yeah. But then I looked into it and it seems like the CIA themselves made it, which pisses me off because everyone thinks they can do marketing. Yeah. See, the, the Canadians didn't think that they needed to do all this stuff. Uh, the Canadian diplomats felt like, OK, we've given them Canadian passports. We could just walk no, out. Oh, you got to spin that story. Don't yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Americans love love a little bit of spin, don't they? Do you think this Lord of Light? Yeah. Screenplay was so bad <laughs> that they, they knew that it was never going to be made. So. Oh, I don't know. Maybe they bought the Lord of Light screenplay. I don't know. Maybe it would have been a really good movie. It could have been. <laughs> I doubt it. I bet it was crap. <laughs> it was probably crap. To lend credibility to the cover story, Mendez enlisted the help of John Chambers, an accomplished Hollywood makeup artist and a well-connected industry insider. Chambers had previously worked with the CIA on various projects, and his extensive network of contacts in the film industry provided invaluable in making the fake production company appear legitimate. Studio 6 Productions seemed like a genuine movie studio with Chambers' assistance, and the cover story became more believable. But the heat was on. On January 19, 1980, Pat Taylor, Ken Taylor's wife, was shocked to receive a phone call at their residence with the caller asking to speak to one of the Staffords. Someone had leaked their presence at the Taylor's home. It became evident that delaying any further would only heighten the risk. Consequently, two days later, the commencement of the exfiltration was set to begin. However, before the operation could proceed, Ken Taylor was informed that the Americans wanted their own escort officer present, Tony Mendez resulting in another possibly fatal delay. On January 25th, Tony Mendez and another CIA officer arrived in Tehran, posing as additional members of the fabricated film company. Mendez met with the six American diplomats hiding in Canadian embassy staff's homes. He briefed them on the plan and provided them with fake identities, documents, and cover stories to memorize so they could confidently answer any questions they might face at the airport. The day of the rescue operation was January 27, 1980. Tony Mendez and the six American diplomats prepared to leave Iran and head to Tehran's Maribad Airport. At Maribad Airport, the group faced multiple security checkpoints including passport control and luggage checks. They needed to maintain their cover story and composure to avoid arousing suspicion. The Iranian authorities were known for thoroughly scrutinizing travelers and the group was aware that any slip-up could lead to their arrest and potentially endanger their lives. Despite the high stakes, the group managed to pass through all security checkpoints without incident. Their cover story held up under scrutiny, and they successfully boarded a Swiss air flight bound for Zurich, Switzerland. The choice of a Swiss air flight was strategic as Switzerland was a neutral country, still is, during the crisis, and the group would be less likely to face further complications while in transit. Once the plane took off and left Iranian airspace, the group could finally breathe a sigh of relief. They had successfully evaded capture and were on their way to freedom. The daring rescue operation, which relied heavily on the group's ability to pose convincingly as a Canadian film crew, had been a success. The six American diplomats were eventually reunited with their families and welcomed home as heroes. Imagine the relief when you when you like when the wheels were up yeah i watched that documentary our man in iran and they mentioned like when the wheels went up and drinks were served a cheer went up it was like, yeah. yeah it's like oh thank goodness we're 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 flying away from this nonsense yeah yeah i've, I've traveled a lot for work and there's been occasional work trips that were just disasters and you just get on that plane and when the wheels go up you're like thank god it's over yeah these guys would have been like so happy yeah i, I can't even imagine you're so fearful. You hear gunshots in the streets and all that kind of stuff for for months on end, kind of thing. And people are people are being murdered. People who believe what you believe. You're seeing a video of them being paraded around yeah. with blindfolds on and and that kind of thing. I mean, there are people you know and people yeah. you've worked with. You know that guy in the blindfold. Yeah, that's so crazy. Yeah. 
After the successful exfiltration of the six American diplomats on January 27, 1980, the remaining Canadian diplomats left Tehran on January 28. Under Prime Minister Joe Clark, the Canadian government decided to close the Canadian embassy in Iran due to the deteriorating security situation and concerns for the safety of its staff. The Canadian diplomats, including Ambassador Ken Taylor, and the remaining embassy staff were evacuated from Tehran under the pretext of a temporary closure for security upgrades. They boarded a Canadian Forces aircraft sent to Tehran to transport them back to Canada. The Iranian government was not informed of the Canadians' involvement in the rescue of the American diplomats at the time, so the departure of the Canadian diplomats occurred without incident. The role of the Canadian diplomats and the Government of Canada in the rescue of six Americans remained a secret until it was declassified and publicly acknowledged on January 29, 1980, after everybody had fled. During a press conference held on January 29th in Ottawa, then Prime Minister Joe Clark spoke about the Canadian caper. He stated, quote, At 9.45 this morning, Eastern Standard Time, a Canadian aircraft carrying six American citizens who had been hiding in Tehran for the past three months touched down at Montreal's Mirabel Airport. The six had left Tehran on Sunday under the protection of Canadian passports, end quote. The Canadian diplomats, particularly Ken Taylor, were hailed as heroes in both Canada and the U.S. for their efforts in the successful rescue operation. For negotiation purposes, President Jimmy Carter had publicly insisted that all the missing American diplomats were being held hostage, so the news of the rescue of six diplomats was a total surprise to the public. The American people widely expressed their gratitude for the actions of the Canadians, with numerous television personalities and everyday citizens showing appreciation, particularly toward Ken Taylor. The Canadian flag was raised at numerous locations across the United States, and thank you billboards featuring ads expressing gratitude were prominently displayed. The valiant Canadians who played a crucial role in the rescue were honored with the prestigious Order of Canada, the nation's second highest civilian award. The recipients were Ambassador Ken Taylor, Immigration Officer John Sheardown, Mary Catherine O'Flaherty, the Communications Officer, Roger Lucy, a Political Officer and First Secretary at the Canadian Embassy, Laverna Katie Dollymore, who was Personal Secretary to Ambassador Taylor. The exclusion of Pat Taylor and Zena Sheardown from the initial honor sparked strong protests from the Foreign Service spouses who felt their contributions deserved recognition. In response to this outcry, Pat Taylor and Zena Sheardown were eventually honored with membership in the Order of Canada as well, acknowledging their vital roles in the rescue mission. In Washington, Jimmy Carter awarded Ken Taylor with a Congressional Gold Medal for his heroism. The Iranian government was upset with Canada for what it saw as a violation of Iran's sovereignty, but oh well, Canada did the right thing. After retiring from the CIA in 1990, Tony Mendez became a writer and an artist, and he co-authored several books about his experiences, including Master of Disguise, My Secret Life in the CIA, and Argo, How the CIA and Hollywood Pulled Off the Most Audacious Rescue in History. He also worked as a consultant for the entertainment industry and a technical advisor on the Ben Affleck-directed Oscar-winning Best Picture film, Argo, based on his book. Ben Affleck played Mendez in the movie. Sadly, Tony Mendez passed away in 2019. On seeing the film Argo, Jimmy Carter was candid about the inaccuracies he saw in the storytelling. He said to CNN's Piers Morgan, quote, well, let me say, first of all, it's a great drama, and I hope it gets the Academy Award for Best Film because I think it deserves it. The other thing that I would say was that 90% of the contributions to the ideas and the consummation of the plan was Canadian, and the movie gives almost full credit to the American CIA, and with that exception, the movie is very good. President Carter continued pointing out another inaccuracy with the film. He said, quote, Ben Affleck's character in the film, Tony Mendez, was only in Iran a day and a half, and the main hero, in my opinion, was Ken Taylor, who was the Canadian ambassador who orchestrated the entire process. I was informed about it the first day, and I was very much involved with the Canadian government because the Canadian government would not legally permit six false passports to be issued. 
So the Canadian Parliament had to go into secret session for the first time in history, and they voted to let us use six Canadian passports that were false. End quote. When Morgan asked whether Carter felt his involvement in the plan to exfiltrate the Americans was bold, he replied, quote, It was much bolder for the Canadian government to do it, because the Canadian government was not involved in the hostage crisis, as you know. They could have been hostages themselves had it been revealed. But as I said, you know, they did the primary work. And as a matter of fact, the American hostages left Iran and landed in Switzerland and landed before the Iranians ever discovered that they had been there. When I left office, I ordained that we would not reveal any Americans' involvement in the process, but to give the Canadians full credit for the entire heroic episode. And that prevailed for a number of years afterward. But I think it's a great film and it tells a dramatic story. And I think it's accurate enough. End quote. Ken Taylor said that he felt the movie was thrilling, but noticed that in the film, the Canadians had more of a supporting role to Mendez and the Americans involved. Taylor wasn't surprised. He said, quote, if another movie was made with a Canadian focus, it would focus on Ottawa rather than Washington, end quote. According to Global News, Canadian director Drew Taylor, unrelated to Ken, worked with the former ambassador on a 2013 documentary called Our Man in Tehran. We mentioned that before. Drew Taylor referred to Ken Taylor's true efforts. Quote, we did a whole documentary on it and didn't even get everything that we would have wanted to cover in it into an hour and a half, Drew Taylor told Global News. He did a lot of amazing things, along with a lot of other people, including his wife, Pat. The Toronto-based director said that he was honored to be able to tell the accurate account of Ken Taylor's actions. It was just a natural impulse for him, he said. Risking his life was not even a thought. It literally came down to it was the right thing to do, and he did it. I think the effects of what Canadians did and what Ken led the charge for in Iran will be around for a long, long time, Drew Taylor said. Whether people elsewhere know the story of what Ken did specifically or not, part of their sentiments on how they feel about Canadians is deeply rooted in actions that he and others have made throughout Canadian history. End quote. In October 2015, Ken Taylor passed away, surrounded by his family members at the New York Presbyterian Hospital. Condolences came from Canadian political party leaders. Quote, as Canada's ambassador to Iran during the Iranian Revolution, Taylor valiantly risked his own life by shielding a group of American diplomats from capture. Prime Minister Stephen Harper said in a statement, Ken Taylor represented the very best that Canada's foreign service has to offer. End quote. NDP leader Tom Mulclair called Taylor a heroic Canadian diplomat, educator, and a businessman. Liberal leader at the time, Justin Trudeau wrote, quote, Ken Taylor was a great ambassador and a true Canadian hero for his life-saving actions during the Iranian Revolution. He'll be missed, end quote. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter also released a statement. He wrote, quote, Rosalind and I are deeply saddened to learn of the death of former Canadian ambassador to Iran, Ken Taylor. His selfless acts and courage saved the lives of U.S. citizens in Iran and made him a hero to all Americans. We will miss his personal friendship and extend sincere condolences to his wife, Pat, and his son, Douglas. End quote. In Drew Taylor's documentary, former Prime Minister Joe Clark summed up the Canadian caper perfectly with this one sentence. This was Canada at its best. And I think he was right about that. Yeah? Yeah. The way we reacted to that, the way Canada reacted, I mean, there was a lot that went on behind the scenes. I mean, special in-council meetings with passports being created, fake passports being created by our government. Yeah. You know, like that is a sacred document to us, the passport. It is to every country. And we allowed these six Americans to have our passports, you know, to escape. Could have been done another way, but just the way that... It was quite smart, wasn't it? Yeah. It was quite smart. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. 
All righty. It is time for some voicemails. Uh, yeah, we've got a few this week. Let's have a listen. Some people have sent some interesting things. So, Hi, this is Leanne calling from the Boston Comments. I listen to your podcast a lot, and I am here waiting to get on my bus to go run the Boston Marathon. Your episodes have gotten me through many miles and kilometers of training that I've done to get here. Four months ago, I was in a coma and was able to get my health back just enough so that I can make it to the start line here today. I'm from Grand Noranda, Quebec, and my husband was born and lived in Chape until he was eight years old, so it was really nice hearing your story about the Chicago fire. Some of his family members had been there but left before the fire started. Anyway, uh, bye. <laughs> uh, so the uh, Boston Marathon, y- you actually have to qualify for that. You can't just show up and run. So that's pretty, that's a pretty cool accomplishment. And recently I've been watching some documentaries on the Boston bombing, which, you know, I hate to bring things down to there, but whenever I think about the Boston Marathon now, I have to kind of think about that incident as well. Mm. But uh, and she listens to us while she trains. Yeah, it's it's great to. We should start speaking at 120, 240 beats per minute. Oh gosh! To keep I, her pace up. I think your brain goes there. I think that's what you're. Do you ever was, listen to like like techno when you're running? Uh, yeah, yeah, it I have. Just keeps yeah. you going, right? Yeah. Well, I'm right now. I probably would listen to like ballads while I <laughs> while I sort of saunter. Classical. <laughs> yes, exactly. But uh, she's in, she was in a coma just months ago. That's quite an accomplishment from coma to Boston Marathon. That's really cool. Don't you think? I'm trying to think of something that rhymes with coma. Uh, coma to way to go, MoMA. Okay. No, that's great. Like that's, I mean, if you're in that sort of situation, like that's extra, extra devotion you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. That's incredible. Yeah. But it's like you you got something that you're working toward. Yeah. 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 Have you ever been in a coma? I have not been in a well, I've been in self and ind- drug induced sort of comas. Okay. But uh, you know. Not a coma coma. Not a coma coma, no. Um, here's another one. Let's have a listen to this one. Hi guys. One of the reasons I'm finally calling in is to help you pronounce my name. I'm Jen Hesse, like Jesse, but with an H, calling from Everett. But the reason I decided that now is the time is I heard you emphasize Canada when speaking of antique Chinese sentiment historically and leaned into, into other marginalized groups when we were talking about the same time period in the United States. I want to be sure that we aren't putting blinders to the anti-Chinese sentiment that existed here too. In the 19th century, rising to the 18th 82 Chinese Exclusion Act. Anti-Chinese sentiment in the U.S. was just as bad as it was in Canada. We had a large number of Chinese immigrants build our entire West Coast, particularly in California. They were then exported rather forcibly back to China as soon as the work was done. One of my students a few years back is a descendant of one of those workers and helped me understand the intensity of this racism and its impact in his recent family history. His parents were one of the first ones back here. Your picture, the picture you described in this week's episode with the woman and the opium pipe sounds like those from history books back when I was in school in the 80s and 90s. Back then, of course, those books and the teachers uh, didn't really address the racism that went with those pictures, really just the anti-drug lessons. And oh yes, I remember that fried egg commercial really well. Matthew, I'm so glad you uh, got to use that message against racism instead. Thank you for being the good eggs you are. Now go shit in your hat and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Jen Hesse. Thank you, Jen Hesse. Yeah, one of our uh, Yumber Yarders. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it, and it's interesting. It's, um, I actually, you know, I've started working on an episode. On, yes. On, uh, it's taken me a while, ch- uh, Chinese um, head tax. And yes, I'm act. tapping my watch. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, you know, the story I was telling when it came to the criminalization of, of cannabis, mm-hmm. um, uh, the reason why I talked about different minority groups between Canada and the United States because it, we used different ones for the anti-drug laws at the time. Right. So, um, yeah, definitely happened in the States. Um, and I'm going to include a little bit of that. 
on that episode. I have to keep promising everyone that I'm going to write this. Well, there you go. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Or not. Or not. I mean, it's it's an interesting topic to dig into. Yeah. Uh, obviously, when I sa- say... It sounds like fun. Sounds like fun. I don't mean <laughs> excluding Chinese from Canada. <laughs> no. But uh, yeah, it, it, we, we're aware that uh, it happened in the U.S. as well. San but Francisco. Yeah, Korea. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And we have one more. And this one right. looks like it comes to us from Prince Edward Island. P-E-I. Yeah. Hi, Mike and Matthew. My name's Lacey. I'm calling from Prince Edward Island. Um, I grew up in the country and now I live in the sticks even further. I know Mike has been here. I don't know if Matthew has, but if you haven't, it's a beautiful place to visit. I just listened to your latest podcast and just really enjoy the history you guys bring to it and the wholesomeness that you bring, even in these dark episodes. Uh, I just wanted to share a little bit, like growing up in PEI, we have lots of First Nations communities. Um, When I grew up in school, we had Mi'kmaq classes that we had to take. And it was very helpful to see the light in these dark times, especially now. And it's just very thankful that we got to experience that as children. Even like at our Christmas concerts, we had to sing songs in Mi'kmaq and learn these things that were so nice to incorporate in our culture, not just French and English songs, which a lot of places did. Um, With the controversies that are now coming out, it is great that the truth needs to be told, but it's also great to hear these wonderful and beautiful traditions. Like in school, we used to have what, uh, gatherings, but I can't even think what they're called right now, where we'd have people come in and show us drum ceremonies, show us dances. We had a ceremony where they invited us to release a rehabilitated eagle, and the chief came and blessed the whole thing. Again, in these dark moments that pop up in history, and now that are being told truthfully, to some extent, obviously, it's still being washed, but... It is nice that I got to experience these things because I don't know if everyone in Canada has. Anyway, I always have looked forward to listening to your guys' podcast. I don't know if you can guess what I do for a living. Um, (laughs) Obviously, it's not storytelling. I appreciate the show that you guys bring, the information, no matter how sad, dark, and sometimes there's a little bit of humor. Thanks so much for being there each week to listen to and can't wait for the next episode. Now go take a shit in your hat. Okay, what does she do for a living? Well, Matthew. she said she moved from the country to the sticks. <laughs> Which is like, that's... Which is fantastic. That, it's like, like, is that like you, you lived in the field and now you're in the back 40? Yeah, pretty much. You know what I mean? Yep. I think she is a purveyor of back 40 bonfire parties. Bonfire parties? In so the back 40. So is it, it's like raves for, for rural yeah, people. Yeah. That's, that, that's what, that's what those parties were, weren't they? Yes, were exactly. Ra- ra- raves for the rural people. We <laughs> used to do them when I was yep, a kid. Totally. So I think she's a back 40 party planner. There you go. That's <laughs> kind of fun. Uh, thanks for your voicemail. Uh, she made some really good points about education and, uh, as specifically the Mi'kmaq people in, uh, Nova Scotia, PEI in Atlantic Canada, Um, there were not a lot of things that I was taught, uh, about. I'm wondering how old Lacey is. I don't know. Because I'm wondering if, um, she lucked out and they just had good schools that were doing it. Yeah. Or if she's slightly younger than us. Probably, yeah. Um, because we got none of that. None of that. Yeah. I mean, we were taught about, you know, the whitewashed version of things, how, uh, the indigenous folks and the white folks got along, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, all of that kind of thing. But <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to, um, to hear about it because I mean, in Bridgewater where I grew up, there wasn't as far as I knew an indigenous population at all, at all. Mm-hmm. Um, there were kids I know now looking back who were, part of the 60s scoop yep. and brought to uh, 
Bridgewater. White families. To white families, yeah. That's not to say that the parents weren't good to them. No, absolutely. It's just, it's a bigger cultural it's, issue. That yeah, it's a here. bigger cultural issue. But uh, yeah, so these kids uh, who were from these communities, uh, taken from those communities, essentially lost their entire heritage. Well, that was the point. Yeah, yeah. That whole assimilate them into white culture by stealing them. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that that's a whole other... <laughs> We will do an episode on the 60s scoop. I've been planning it. Okay. But uh, it's it's such a big issue. I want to make sure that we do it the right way. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARKPTN. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right. So first up, we have uh, Shana Fortin Cosma from Ramouski, Quebec. Rimouski. As one of our patrons. Yeah. So uh, Ramouski. I have never been to Ramouski, but uh, interestingly, she calls herself Shana FK Quiet Anna. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. So she's quiet. Shana, Shana, Quiet Anna. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. With banana. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what does Shanna do there in Ramouski, Matthew? I think she drives one of those Zodiac boats and gives like boat tours of like the St. Barnaby Island and stuff like that. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. So she's like, in those little. I would have liked to have done that. Zodiac given boat boats. tours. Yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah. I think, but yeah, that's what she does. That's a lot of responsibility, though, especially if somebody tips off your boat by accident. And, this is true. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for your patronage. Thank you for your patronage. <laughs> uh, so let's move on to donut money donors. Okay. We have uh, Heather Rajot, and Heather we've we've heard from before. She says. Hi, Mike and Matthew. I really enjoyed the different episode style this week. My eyeballs got a great workout from constantly rolling whilst listening to all the ridiculousness. It was also very informative and I learned a lot. If you're looking to do more episodes in this style, I would humbly recast my vote for one on British home children. Yeah, we're thinking about that okay. too. I'm sure that Matthew would uh, be a great voice of information on that subject. Please enjoy some donuts on me and don't forget... Some treats for Steve, Ego, and Waffle. Oh, thank you, Heather. Uh, thanks, as always, for making my week. P.S. Matthew has never guessed my occupation, if he'd like to try. Well, first we need to know where Heather lives. Zurich. S Zurich in Switzerland? Yeah. She's oh, okay. A Swiss, she's a Swiss air flight attendant. She was on that plane. Wow. From today's episode. D she was on the plane. She served the drinks. Yeah, she served the drinks. Wow. That's really cool. She popped that champagne cork and was like, congratulations, everyone. Congratulations for being alive. Yeah. So, for making it out. So uh, she was there when history was made, Mike. There, there you go. Um, so Jennifer Hesse is Hello our, again, Jennifer our Hesse. next donut money donor. And now I understand why. She says... Hear voicemail for my name pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer Hesse. <laughs> Wanted to celebrate two years of Matthew as co-host and hearing 100 episodes of Dark Poutine. Wow. Yeah, we didn't have a little party for me. Two years was like... We had sushi today. That's true. <laughs> Since I'm going backwards from the time I started, don't worry, I'm keeping up with the new. I'm going to miss Matthew's voice in those older episodes now. Keep up the great work. Ah, oh, but we have a surprise for you. Well, no, they will have already heard the surprise. Okay. Well, if you didn't. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, we're redoing so, some of them. Some of them we're redoing. And the way I think we want to redo the episodes is we will we'll remove an old episode, but we'll add one by doing one, uh, a series. So each each one that I remove will be, you'll get two. So you don't really lose anything. Fantastic. If that makes sense. So just as much value for your dark poutine buck. <laughs> now with new improved co-host. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. Are you going to keep that in? <laughs> I'm going to leave that in. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> anyway, 
So Jennifer Hesse, uh, we know what she does now. Yes. What did we say that she did? What did you say she did? I didn't say she did anything. Okay. So Jennifer Hesse, you, you, you know what she does. What does she do, Matthew? Jennifer? Yeah. She's a history teacher. What? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's doing it right. She's doing it right. Yeah. She's bucking the system. How so? She's ignoring the old textbooks. <laughs> she's getting to the truth. Getting to the truth. That's probably she's a good idea. She's bringing people in. Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, we have uh, our next donut money donor. You is know, some... teaching, teaching, sorry to interrupt. Teaching could be an act of rebellion. It could be, yeah. Right? If there are teachers that were like, these books are crapola. I'm going to teach it the way that I know the truth happened. Yeah. It could get into trouble. Because it's not what everyone's saying should be said. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> so, Jennifer, you may think I gave you a boring job, but in fact, no, I made you a member of the Rebel Alliance. One of my favorite te teachers was a history teacher, John Derrick. Was, was he a name. rebel? He was inter an interesting guy. Yeah. He had uh, received an injury during the war, so he had one leg shorter than the other, and... Uh, the but, way you say that, receive. We would like to present you this injury. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> but he was, uh, well, his daughter actually now is uh, a Supreme Court justice in Nova Scotia. So he was an interesting character. He was the head uh, headmaster at the private school before he came to Bridgewater to teach history. Okay. And his favorite, on summer afternoons, he knew people weren't going to show up for his class. He just knew. So he would have an attendance test and he would give people 100% for answering here. So he would show up to Mr. Derek's class oh. and he would say, okay, we're having a test today. And the test is, are you here or not? And so if you were there, you got a hundred percent. Wow. Yeah. And did it go towards your grade? It did. Yep. And did, did you guys skip? We didn't skip out. Oh my gosh, we skipped out all the time. But Mr. Derek's favorite term was, oh, you wretched creature. He was, <laughs> you, he was, he was British. So you he, wretched you creature. You wretched creature. Fantastic. Yeah, he was a great guy. I, I really miss him, actually. Uh, but let's move on to our next Donut Money donor. And it's somebody we've heard from before. And it's someone local. From oh. Surrey, British Columbia, Manjot Singh. Manjot! It's yeah. great to hear from you again. Yes, thank you so much. So we've given Manjot a job before. Uh, so what do you think they do, Matthew? I think Manjot designs cycling gear. Cycling gear? Makes you, to make you more aerodynamic. Oh, that's really cool. Like, right? a, like the fairing on a motorcycle, but it's something you wear. Like all your wearables in... And Manjot does like a little bit of, the, there's tech in the gear to measure heart rate and all that sort of stuff. Are there like neon lights like Tron? There has to be. Just to protect you from getting hit by a car. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. So it's very safety conscious. You get safety and speed. Safety and speed. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Well, thank you, Manjot. Working it's, with all kinds of polymers and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. I've I always wanted to be able to do... Uh, make my own costumes. Like, I know cosplay is a thing. It is now. But when I was a kid, I used to make my own costumes. I made like a zombie and I did all kinds of different costumes, but I always wanted uh, a vacuum, uh, I, the c machine that would make the armor for like uh, a stormtrooper because I always wanted to be a stormtrooper. <laughs> When I was eight, I went to, to school one day for the Halloween. You're supposed to dress up. I went in drag. Yeah. At eight years old. Good for you. Yep. Yeah. I like doing drag. It's the, fun. One of the reasons why I wanted to do it, though, mm -hmm. is so I could have my mom's lipstick, so I could lipstick people's windows if they didn't give us good kids. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew was not a good kid. Anyway, so thank you to all our Donut Money. Donut. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and, uh patron. Thank you. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. 
For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening, and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this episode of Dark Poutine. So until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Wish me happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, Matthew. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Bye, everyone. Bye. Hi, it's Shauna, and I might be a bad parent because my kids think french fries are vegetables. Hey, it's Ryan, and I might be a bad parent because I went out for wings when my wife was in the hospital after giving birth. Johnny here. I might be a bad parent because in my house, the tooth fairy gives pocket change. But we're not alone. Len emailed us and said his six-year-old daughter's Tarzan moment going from love seat to lazy boy by curtains made him more proud than any dance (laughs) recital. (laughs) And Andy left his two-year-old at the rink. All right, guys, I'm sure we're not alone, like Andy's kid. For stories and confessions like this, make sure you check out our podcast. It's called Bad Parents, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. I left a glove at the rink.